Warm greetings. My name is Tony Fauci, and I would like to again thank the FIDOE Executive Committee for selecting me for the honor of the 2021 Internal Medicine Research Award. I would also like to express my deep respect and gratitude to the physicians of FIDOE who have been on the front lines across Italy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Your dedication to your patients, medical knowledge, and compassion is simply amazing. The world continues to benefit from your contributions to clinical knowledge and research, leading to improved care of patients with COVID-19. I am pleased to speak with you today at the FADOI National Congress on COVID-19 in 2021, lessons learned and remaining challenges. And so let us begin with the discussion. In the beginning of the outbreak in January of 2020, I wrote a viewpoint for the Journal of the American Medical Association, and I entitled it Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. I was not trying to be facetious with that title, but I just wanted to point out to the readers of the viewpoint that we have had decades of experience with coronaviruses that antedated what we are experiencing now. And in fact, if one looks at the phylogenetic tree of coronaviruses, the human coronaviruses are in red font, but the yellow highlighted viruses are those that are currently and have been for a very long time, the cause of maybe 10 to 15 to 25% of the common colds that we experience continually, usually throughout the winter months. However, in 2002 and in 2012, we had the experiences with the first pandemic or potemic pandential potential coronaviruses, the severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 and the Middle East respiratory syndrome in 2012. And these are where these viruses fit in the phylogenetic tree shown here in the yellow highlight. What we're facing with today is yet again, another but now unprecedented in its impact, coronavirus that leading to a pandemic. And as we all recall, as cases of an unusual pneumonia appeared in December of 2019, in the Wuhan Central District of China. Soon thereafter, in the first week and a half of January of 2020, the Chinese identified and put on a public database the sequence of this novel coronavirus. And here it is shown on the phylogenetic tree with the yellow highlight, very close to the SARS-CoV-1 but also close to a number of bat viruses. Fast forward to what we see here today, we are now experiencing the most impactful respiratory disease pandemic in more than 100 years, dating back to the historic influenza pandemic of 1918. Currently, as of just literally a couple of days ago, we now have 230 million cases worldwide and more than 4.7 million cases that have died. In virology, we now see and learn an awful lot about this virus. As I mentioned on a previous slide, it is a beta coronavirus. It is an RNA virus with a large genome. It has four structural proteins the most important of which is the S protein, particularly with its receptor binding domain that binds to the ACE2 receptor seen on cells in the upper airway, hence the entry of the virus into the body, the lungs, the GI tract, cardiovascular tissue, and endothelial cells. So it's a rather widespread receptor. With regard to the transmission of the virus, 
It has now been very well studied. It is transmitted by exposure to respiratory fluids, either typical respiratory droplets, or as we've learned over the years, aerosol particles also transmit. These droplets or particles are, put, are deposited on exposed mucous membranes in the mouth, nose, or ears. Transmission is much, much less common through contact with contaminated surfaces. And the greatest risk is in enclosed places, hence always saying that outdoors is always better than indoors for protection. But particularly places with poor ventilation and during behaviors that lead to the expression of these droplets, such as exercise, singing, or prolonged indoor exposure. There are some very unique aspects of this virus, one of the most important of which is that a virus that, as I mentioned, can kill so many people globally, at least one third and maybe 40% of patients who develop infection never develop symptoms, which is much most unusual to have a virus that has such deadly potential but yet can be asymptomatic for such a large proportion of people who get infected. Another very unique aspect of this virus is the fact that close to 60% of all the transmissions result from transmission from an asymptomatic person, namely someone who will never develop symptoms or someone who is pre-symptomatic and will soon develop symptoms. What about the clinical manifestations? As I mentioned a moment ago, a significant proportion of people never develop symptoms. But for those who do develop symptoms, the clinical presentation strongly resembles that of a flu-like syndrome, as shown by the signs and symptoms on this slide. However, there is a very unique aspect of the symptomatology, and that is that in a significant proportion of people, there is a curious loss of smell and taste, which precedes the onset of the respiratory symptoms and can actually continue to uh, persist even after recovery from the viral infection. For those who do get symptoms, about 80% are mild to moderate, whereas anywhere from 15 to 20% are either severe or critical, leading to a case fatality rate overall of about 2.3% of symptomatic people. However, 20% or more for those who require ventilatory assistance with a, uh, ventilator, a, a ventilator. What about the people who are increased risk for severe COVID-19 illness? They are older adults, as well as people of any age who have certain underlying medical conditions. Paramount among these are obesity, pulmonary disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and other organ system dysfunction leads in many patients to an increased likelihood of having a severe outcome if they get infected with SARS-CoV-2. The manifestations of severe disease are protean. It's dominated by the acute respiratory distress syndrome. But as we've learned more and more about the clinical manifestations of this disease, it's clear that other organ systems can be involved, such as neurological disorders, cardiac dysfunction, acute kidney injury. There's also hypercoagulability, which can lead to stroke or organ system dysfunction. And then we've noticed a very unusual aberrant or hyperinflammatory response usually late in the course of disease, 
which tends to dominate the pathogenic picture even more than viral replication itself. Also, there's a syndrome called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, very reminiscent of Kawasaki syndrome that we've known about for a long time. There's also post-COVID-19 conditions. Some are explainable by residual organ system dysfunction that is directly explained by damage, such as damage to the lung leading after recovery to pulmonary function abnormalities. However, there's about anywhere from 15 to 30% of individuals have a persistence of signs and symptoms for anywhere from weeks to months that are not completely explainable by readily apparent pathogenic processes. This is referred to as long COVID and some of the commonly reported signs and symptoms of long COVID are extreme, sometimes debilitating fatigue, unexplained shortness of breath, muscle aches, dysautonomia, characterized by temperature dysregulation and unexplained tachycardia, sleep disturbances, depression and anxiety, and a very curious situation referred to as brain fog, where people have difficulty focusing or concentrating their thoughts. The medical management of SARS-CoV-2 infected people involves the control of symptoms, usually on an outpatient basis until the person recovers, and organ support, usually requiring hospitalization and organ system reports such as mechanical ventilation. But also there's pharmacological intervention, such as antivirals and immunomodulators. And one can treat the virus directly with drugs, some of which have already been approved by the regulatory agencies, such as remdesivir and other antivirals that are in clinical trial. One of the most important direct antiviral agents that have proved successful are the monoclonal antibodies, usually in combination by companies such as Regeneron, Lilly, GSK, and Vare, and others. Also, one can moderate the host response, such as with dexamethasone, when you have a hyper or an aberrant inflammatory response. Also, monoclonal antibodies against certain of the inflammatory mediators, such as IL-6 and JAK kinase and others. But one of the things that we clearly want to do is to identify vulnerable targets in the SARS-CoV-2 replication cycle and design drugs to inhibit these vulnerable targets. This is very similar to the strategy that was so successfully used in the development of multiple combinations of antiretroviral drugs for HIV and also for hepatitis C virus. This is an example of the rep replication cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And notice that there are multiple targets that potentially can be inhibited by drugs such as polymerase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, entry inhibitors, and others. Let me talk now about a very important subject, vaccines. Clearly, of all the interventions in this historic pandemic, the really striking success story has been with vaccines. There's a very important story behind vaccines. People sometimes are concerned that it was only 11 months from the recognition of the sequence of the virus to the time we had a successful vaccine being administered to individuals. It was 11 months from January 2020 to December 2020. But as I put and wrote about 
in a commentary in science a few months ago in April, the speed and efficiency with which these highly efficacious vaccines were developed and their potential for saving millions of lives are actually due to an extraordinary multidisciplinary effort involving basic preclinical and clinical science that has been underway out of the spotlight and under the radar screen for decades before the unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic. It relates to a number of things, including vaccine immunogen and vaccine platform. With regard to the successful immunogen, it relates to studies that long antedated COVID-19, and that is the structure-based vaccine design that began with studies trying, albeit as yet unsuccessful, to develop a immunogen for an HIV vaccine that would induce neutralizing antibodies. And cryo-EM and structure-based vaccine design enabled investigators to develop a stable, soluble structure of HIV envelope trimer. A number of other laboratories also did this. This was soon applied to other viruses such as respiratory syncytial virus, where investigators such as Barney Graham and others were able using this structure-based design to show that they could stabilize with appropriate mutations the prefusion F protein of respiratory syncytial virus, making it a highly successful immunogen leading to a successful endeavor to develop a respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. When MERS came along, this same approach was taken, structure-based vaccine design of the MERS vaccine, which we never had to use and is still in development. So when SARS-CoV-2 appeared, immediately investigators used the knowledge from the other vaccine attempts to use the same mutations to stabilize the spike protein in its prefusion form to be used as an extremely successful immunogen leading, as I'll mention in a moment, to multiple highly successful vaccines. Vaccine platform advances, particularly in the mRNA vaccine or the viral vectors such as the adenovirus or recombinant proteins have helped lift the field to be able successful vaccines. This goes back many years to the studies of Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman who showed that they could modify the mRNA molecule without triggering key inflammatory pathways and so could overcome an important hurdle to developing a vaccine. Dan Baruch and his colleagues at Harvard had been working with the adenovirus vector predominantly in HIV and in Ebola. So that work antedated the work on SARS-CoV-2. And here on this slide shows three platforms, nucleic acid mRNA, adenovirus vector, and recombinant protein leading to successful vaccines, one of which has been fully approved by the United States FDA, BioNTech, Moderna's mRNA, J&J's adenovirus, AZ is still now being developed and improved in Europe and other places, as well as other vaccines from China, Russia, and other countries. COVID-19 has shown clear efficacy in clinical trials, 94 to 95% efficacy for the mRNA. Its effectiveness in real world settings is very, very clear. And its impact of variants, which I'll mention in a moment, has been extremely important. 
There have now been multiple variants. The one that is dominating in the United States, 99.5% of the isolates are Delta variant. But throughout the world, Delta has now seen in at least 163 countries. Why is it so important? Its transmissibility is very, very efficient, multiple times better and more efficient than other variants. In addition, the viral loads in the upper airway of people who are infected is up to a thousand times greater than other variants like the alpha variant. However, what we've seen is that over time, the effectiveness of vaccines against infection in the context of the Delta variant have diminished considerably as shown on this slide from cohorts in the United States. However, in the United States, there has been a suggestion of waning of effectiveness against severe disease resulting in hospitalizations. Note the Moderna Mayo Clinic in red went from 91 to 81 and the Mayo Clinic Pfizer in green went from 85 to 75. Israel has been ahead of the United States in their vaccination program and what is going on regarding the Delta variant and vaccine as shown on this slide in a fully vaccinated population in Israel, there's been an increase in infections and severe disease, even in people who are vaccinated, leading to the concept of the need of booster shots for SARS-CoV-2. Here's an example of what you do when you actually boost people who have received the Moderna vaccine, a dramatic increase following that third dose. So if you look on the D1, that's right before the third dose. D15 is about 15 days following the third dose. And against multiple variants, you can see there's either 23-fold increase, 32-fold increase, 44-fold increase. Very similar with the Pfizer boost. When you boost individuals, whether they be younger individuals or older individuals, you dramatically increase the antibody levels and ultimately the protection as shown by the Israelis against severe disease as well as infection. Very recently, literally yesterday, the FDA authorized a booster dose of Pfizer vaccine for people 65 years of age or older, 18 to 64, with a high risk of severe COVID-19 due to underlying conditions, and 18 to 64, whose frequent institutional or occupation exposure puts them at high risk of serious complications. What will happen after I give this lecture, because it is happening in real time, is that our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will make a recommendation based on the information on this slide as to actually what the recommendation will be for people in different age groups. The real question is, is the booster shot a booster for waning efficacy and is it a luxury? Or will the booster shot actually be part of the original vaccine regimen? Very similar to the multi-shot regimens we have for measles, for hepatitis C, and for other vaccines. I wanna close by acknowledging that it is very important that simultaneously with even considering boosters, 
we do whatever we can to get the rest of the world vaccinated. Because as shown on this slide, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, a relatively small proportion of the population have received at least one dose, as shown by Africa on this slide. And for that reason, the United States has been pushing very hard and has already committed 1.1 billion doses of vaccines to low and middle income countries and will continue to push and give more doses and try to lead the rest of the world in giving some of their doses to the low and middle income countries. So finally, we're really living in a race and the race is against SARS-CoV-2 and our ability to utilize, make and distribute what we know are highly effective vaccines. And so the challenge is here. We have the capability of ending this. It is really entirely up to our will and our resources to get it done. Thank you very much.